So for our fear circuitry presentation, I would like you to be able to compare and contrast how different regions of the amygdala relate to stress to produce distinct behaviors. I'd like you to be able to compare and compress, contrast the neurobiology of a high versus low road to stress responsivity. Describe a fear conditioning experiment and give its definition. I would like you to know how cannabinoid manipulation and amygdala lesion affect fear conditioning. And finally, what do we know about SM and what are implications for multiple fear mechanisms? Fear conditioning is a type of classical conditioning where a previous neutral stimulus is repeatedly paired with shock or some other unpleasant experience causing the subject to act fearful in response to the stimulus. Fear conditioning can elicit fear by pairing a stimulus with an aversive stimulus, like electric foot shock. Eventually, the first stimulus by itself can produce fear, including freezing and autonomic changes. Interestingly, you might be like to know a little history here. This was first reported as a conditioned reflex, which we now recognize as a conditioned response. Uh, but it was first reported by John Watson, the father of behaviorism. Uh, you know, he uh, demonstrated this in a study uh, where he was actually trying to replicate Pavlov. Pavlov had just demonstrated this famous uh, ringing of the bell experiment, and uh, Watson wanted to replicate that experiment with the salivation and all that, and tried in humans and failed because humans lack the same uh, glands, uh, at least as well as pronounced in dogs. So he actually used uh, one of Pavlov's rivals in Russia by the name of Beshterov. Interestingly, Beshterov was disappeared in Russia. Uh, an incredible story uh, there in and of itself that I highly recommend <laughs> you look up on your own. But uh, Beshterov, uh, who was not a big fan of Pavlov, was his rival, uh, sort of did the same thing as Pavlov, but by using dogs and made them jump over uh, electrical hurdles, uh, or electric shock grids over a hurdle. Uh, so Watson used that same experiment or setup for people, uh, but had them put their hand on a sort of a shocker and uh, showed that he could produce a conditioned avoidance response or sort of like based off of fear in a way, you could get a conditioned re reaction. Uh, you know, based on fearful stimuli, and then eventually the person, uh, you know, technically that's more of an avoidance response, but, uh, you know, there, there is some relationship there. Although, I mean, it is worth noting that avoidance and fear are neurobiologically dissociable concepts, but both involve the amygdala, uh, which is going to be one of the primary circuits that we talk about now. So here you can see sort of a general fear conditioning experiment as illustrated in a cartoon. On, uh, you know, really you, you wouldn't always do this first day, but as an important experiment, you can show that if you play a tone in the animal's uh, box, that this uh, alone uh, isn't sufficient to induce any sort of fearful response or a freezing response. Uh, it also wouldn't increase blood pressure. If you were also looking at that additional physiological measure. Then on the next session, you would uh, put the animal in the box and when the tone plays, uh, also deliver uh, electrical foot shock to the grid floor. Uh, interestingly, the two actually have to overlap if the tone precedes the electrical foot shock or the electrical foot shock precedes the tone, they don't pair. Uh, they do have to overlap by at least a few seconds, uh, typically uh, uh, at, at some point. Uh, and you only have to really pair the, the two uh, two or three times. It doesn't take uh, 50 pairings. Really after just about three pairings, you have very good fear response uh, uh, begin to emerge. And really the animal is going to be freezing the entire time at that point. Uh, they, they sort of turn into a bit of a statue. Uh, and that freezing response is supposed to be is, uh, thought to measure uh, the animal's fear. Then on the, the next day, uh, you would bring in the animal into the uh, apparatus, play back the tone alone, and at this point, the tone alone is sufficient to produce the uh, freezing response uh, without the uh, 
uh, chalk itself. And at this point, you can do various manipulations to see how, for example, a brain lesion would influence the development of the fear and also its extinction over time with the idea that its extinction over time might be uh, relevant for things like post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, it's really not a one-to-one -one relationship and there are advanced models and ways of getting it a better model of post-traumatic stress, but you're getting in that direction uh, you know, uh, by getting at these, uh, the, the extinction of the fear memory. So I want you to be able to tell me about the low and high roads of fear circuitry in the brain. Um, but before we sort of go in there and look at this sort of amygdala centric approach, let's look at it from the, the big picture here. So I mean, you're, you, you would first visualize in a lot of cases, it's not always visual, but you can visualize a uh, fearful <coughs> stimulus and uh, then this information will be processed or at the level of the thalamus where it would then be either relayed along a low road directly to the amygdala or a high road first to the cortex and then back to the amygdala, also at some level through the uh, hippocampus. And it's these low and high roads within the amygdala that we are really gonna focus on, but keep in mind that this is a larger circuit. I mean, therefore we think of the amygdala as being very important here, and it is, it is very important. Uh, you know, there is a larger circuit involved, which is really how the brain works. So now you can see a more fine-tuned, amygdala-centric uh, view of these high and low roads of fear circuitry. Again, you would uh, first uh, bring in whatever information it was through the sensory systems. Then you see things processed by that big relay breaker, the thalamus, the big switch board. Then some of this signal would be relayed along the high road to the cortex and processed also by the hippocampus. Uh, whereas another low road of circuitry will uh, go directly to the amygdala, where it would also converge with information arriving from the high road. At this point, the uh, information is first received by the lateral nucleus of the amygdala. At that point, it would split between three amygdalar circuits. Some would be processed by the basal lateral amygdala, others by the accessory basal nucleus of the amygdala, while still others by the central nucleus of the amygdala. And then all that information would converge at the level of the output nucleus, the central nucleus, and leave the amygdala to one of three brain regions. Part in, of the information would head to the central gray, which is involved and implicated in the emotional response. Other to the lateral hypothalamus, which is known to control autonomic responses and still others to the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, which would influence the hormonal response. Different regions of the amygdala react to a stimulus and send a message to the central nucleus of the amygdala, which would be that big output. And the central nucleus would then transmit the information to different brainstem regions to mediate different components of the fear response. Those that would be emotional, autonomic, and hormonal. The central nucleus projects to the central gray, also known as the periaqueductal gray, uh, a brain region that's also uh, known to be involved in opioid-induced analgesia. But uh, this region uh, is involved in processing emotional uh, responses and associated with the fear circuit. The lateral hypothalamus would uh, be involved in evoking autonomic responses and the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, again, involved in evoking hormonal responses. Learned fear is slow to extinguish. Avoidance behavior is even slower to extinguish. Uh, you know, and, uh, in fact, it's very difficult <laughs> to extinguish it all. But uh, it can be even slower in uh, mice that are lacking a uh, cannabinoid receptors. Uh, the cannabinoid, if you, the mice are missing cannabinoid receptors, uh, you, you see even uh, slower rates of uh, fear extinction. Uh, and this can, the uh, reverse happens if uh, you treat the animal with uh, endocannabinoids or increase their endocannabinoid levels. 
this was first demonstrated by a scientist in Bordeaux, France, by the name of Giovanni Marsicano uh, in a seminal nature study. Um, you know, and then Rafe Mishulam, one of the really uh, leaders in the cannabinoid field who discovered the uh, really, well, first identified and cloned the CB1 receptor in the brain, also identified anandamide and helped identify thoracodonal glycerol as well. But, uh, you know, he likes to point out that, uh, you know, learning how to forget could be more important than learning how to remember. Uh, you know, one of the like stories he likes to point out is, you know, if you were riding home on public transportation, would you, would you really want to remember everybody's face and everything that you saw and smelled along the way? Definitely not. Uh, you know, so, you know, it, it could actually be argued that forgetting is, is a very important function of the brain. And I mean, this is in response to the, the question, like, why on earth would you have endogenous molecules like the endocannabinoids that might be involved in helping to forget things? Could be very evolutionarily advantageous as well. People with damage to their amygdalas bilaterally show little to no fear at all. These people do not show the typical physiological responses to fearful stimuli and have a hard time recognizing fear in others although they can still recognize others' emotions. One of the most famous case studies in the fear literature was from a patient known as SM. She had bilateral amygdalar damage that made her fearless to most triggers. Interestingly, there are additional fear mechanisms for suffocation and physiological state that likely arise from peripheral mechanisms and processing at the level of the brainstem. Uh, if you want to read more about this, uh, here's a link to an article. Uh, I mean, you would have to type it in, but, uh, you know, it would provide additional information about these, uh, you know, additional redundant uh, fear mechanisms. And again, this is, will be a common theme of the brain, that there are a lot of built-in redundancies. Uh, so, I mean, like, even if you do have amygdala damage, you know, you, you might not completely die of suffocation and other things. It's like, uh, there, there's a lot of sort of built-in redundancy in the brain for a reason to, you know, make it resilient uh, in the face of damage and insult. So this is a brief uh, video clip about patient HSM that I think you will find very interesting. So SM is one of the most um, famous case studies in all of affective neuroscience. Um, she is a woman who is currently, I think, in her 40s. And um, as far as we can tell, the destruction of her amygdala has left her essentially fearless to at least external stimuli. And um, to test whether SM is in fact fearless, the researchers who worked with her took her to a couple of um, the, the most frightening places that they could think of in the local area. So one was an exotic pet store, and they offered her uh, exotic snakes to, to hold in the store, even though she says she's afraid of snakes. Many people would hesitate to hold a snake right up to their face and touch its tongue and inspect its face really closely, but SM had no problem doing that. Um, they also took her to a place that uh, it is at least called the most haunted house in the United States, and they decorated it for Halloween, and they have people, the staff, dressing up as monsters and things to try to scare people. And the researchers in SM went through with just a regular group. And all the other people who were in the group, as soon as they were in this haunted house, it was apparently very spooky, were you know, huddling together and they were really slow to go around corners. And SM was taking the lead and saying, come on guys, follow me. And she would be the first around the corners. And when the monsters jumped out and tried to scare her, apparently she would scare them sometimes because she uh, had no fear response to them, which they were not expecting. And, um, and so what was really interesting about this is that SM is not emotionless. She, she experienced um, a lot of curiosity and excitement which we think are governed by um, other regions of the brain predominantly, um, but she just doesn't seem to have any normal anticipatory fear response. Um, but her, her lack of a fear response gets her in trouble. So she uh, apparently walked home in the evenings through sort of a vacant lot and she was mugged there at one point and I think at knife point. And uh, most people, when something scary like that happens to you and you are at risk of getting hurt, you have a normal fear response when you're approaching that same place that would send you avoiding it. I mean, that's what the fear response is all about, avoid things that might hurt you. Uh, and she doesn't have that response, so she continues to take that same route home every night by herself. And here's just a, a graph from your book illustrating 
uh, a variety of independent fearful stimuli or independent measures of fear that evoke uh, a rating of fear in control subjects, but not in SM. 